Welcome back everybody to the Cold War for A-Level History. This lesson is going to focus on the policy of containment. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to unpack how containment was actually initiated in practice, but we're not going to examine each of the individual policies in detail in this video because they all deserve their own series of lessons each. So we're going to just outline what the policy of containment was, we're going to talk about the different uh, ways in which the Allied powers, the US, the UK, etc., etc., exhibited the policy of containment. And then we're going to focus on the motivation for the policy of containment. Why was it introduced? What is the purpose of having these particular policies that were very, very costly, cost a lot of money, a lot of lives in some instances? And uh, really, how did this begin to ramp up the tensions between the capitalist communist divide between? the East and West and uh, subsequently the, the Cold War itself. So the first question is just what is the policy of containment? Well, containment itself isn't actually a policy because it was just a broad uh, word that was used to describe actually a range of policies themselves. So it was really a collection of policies that all aimed to, as the name suggests, contain the spread of communism, mainly in Europe as well as in Asia. Now, the specific initiatives include methods to support free and de uh, democratic capitalist states against communism in both the USSR and China, and as well as a couple of others as well. So it was on the one hand supporting uh, free capitalism uh, in some regions from the threat of communism, specifically coming from the USSR and China. But in other instances, the policy of containment actually would lead to uh, the uh, the uh, execution of ground troops to specific regions. So we'll talk about how the policy of containment influences the decision to enter into conflict in Korea, as well as entering into conflict in Vietnam. So these are all instances that we have to explore. Specific initiatives that we would sort of class under this broad umbrella term containment include the Truman Doctrine, they include the Marshall Plan, they include the establishment of West Germany, the West German state, also the establishment of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, as well as the reconstruction and support of the state of Japan. Now, Japan is very, very interesting in its position within the Cold War because Japan represented somewhat of a contradiction for US foreign policy. Because if we were, for those who um, don't know, the United States was actually at war with Japan until 1945. And so therefore, we have this um, we have this contradiction between the fact that there is a conflict that has just ended between the United States and Japan and the desire to maintain uh, democratic independence and um, keep Japan free from uh, from communism. Uh, and so we have a bit of a contradiction in terms of policy there. So we'll explore each of these different policies in their own separate lessons in a lot more detail. So this is just going to represent a more holistic understanding of what containment actually meant. So let's think about the motivations for the policy of containment. Why did the Allied powers suggest that containment is a good idea? Well, there are a number of cited reasons from, uh, from an historical perspective. Historians would not agree on a single uh, motivation that led specifically and directly to the policy of containment because it was a collection of reasons why. Now, the cited main reasons, the main cited reasons include Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech, the uh, Kinnan's long telegram, as well as the impact of the Greek Civil War. And we're going to examine each of these individually in this lesson. So, beginning with Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech, one of the most famous speeches, at least arguably the most famous speech during the Cold War, um, it was delivered in 1946 to, uh, to a number of individuals in Fulton, Missouri, and it was an influential speech since it essentially outlined a state of affairs within European politics and quite aptly explained how foreign policy is going to behave over the next 40 or 50 plus years when the Cold War um, starts to really ramp up. In the speech, Churchill made a number of points relating to the disparity 
between communism and capitalism, as well as this establishment of an east-west divide that began to develop. It was particularly famous, and the reason why it's got the name Iron Curtain speech, because Churchill argued that an Iron Curtain has descended across Europe between the communist USSR and the capitalist states in the West. And so, as a result of this, we get the idea that this is an Iron Curtain speech. The speech was one that was in line with the broader policies that were supported by Truman. Um, it was not taken very well by Stalin, who argued that the speech was akin to a declaration of war, because Churchill was very, very pejorative towards the, Uni uh, the USSR, the, the Soviet Union. He made the claim that because of this Iron Curtain existing across the East-West Divide, and because of how terrible communism communism essentially was, according to Winston Churchill, um, that this divide is going to define foreign policy, specifically within European politics more broadly. So Stalin wasn't particularly very happy about this speech, um, but this speech, as mentioned, was in line with the Truman Doctrine, or was in line with Truman's broader policies, uh, broader ideas, and it showed that there was a certain allyship between uh, the United States and the United Kingdom. On top of the Iron Curtain speech, we also have the long telegram. Okay, this this was a, uh, a telegram uh, that was quite long, as the name suggests, that came from US diplomat um, George Keenan. Now, George Keenan was a diplomat who had been living in Moscow since 1933. So he had quite a lot of insider information relating to the way in which uh, politics was operating within the, uh, the, the capital of the Soviet Union. In 1946, the long telegram would be sent to the US government. And when I say long telegram, it was 8,000 words. So it was a, quite a, a, a sizable essay that was sent to the US government. And it made a number of claims about the Soviet Union. He made the claim that the USSR was seeking a policy of broader global expansionism, which of course would tie into the fears of the United States in the first place. And they also made the claim that the, uh, that the Soviet Union was a cruel and repressive state dictatorship, which is true, it was. So the two points that are made here are very important because the policy of containment was trying to act against this idea that the USSR and that Stalin wanted to see communism expand outwards towards other states. And this does sort of tie somewhat into the idea that um, Stalin's motivation for the creation of this uh, uh, this series of buffer states in the East, for example, was because of the um, uh, was because of essentially a, a, a hostility against the Western capitalist um, countries. But this goes against that idea. It goes for a more expansionist idea, where Stalin actually wants to see communism expand broadly across the world. And so we have a problem here because that's where the idea of containment really comes into practice. A year later, in 1947, Keenan would write the Mr. X article in the Foreign Affairs Journal. And its formal title is The Sources of Soviet Conduct. And in this article, it was argued that communism ought to be... Um, uh, met with a firm and vigilant policy of containment. So not only did the long telegram confirm what a number of US individuals suspected about the general foreign policy of the USSR, which was that they wanted to expand communism outwards into Eastern Europe and into other parts of Asia and other where, everywhere else in the world, it didn't just confirm that, it also confirmed what they already knew, which was that the USSR was a cruel and repressive state dictatorship. And then in 1947, the Mr. X article continues this and suggests that communism has to be met with a firm and vigilant policy of containment. Again, or you, you can understand why this would tie into the motivations for um, establishing the policy of containment and all of the different initiatives that came with that. Finally, we have the Greek Civil War. Now, the Greek Civil War was a situation where we have actual on-the-ground um, problems that um, would uh, eventually see uh, would eventually see Great Britain withdrawing from that particular region and the United States wanting to get involved themselves. But there was a fear that communism would spread into Greece because Greece is relatively close to to Russia and it would be very uh, was very close to the buffer states that become established um, at the end of the Second World War. 
And um, for the most part, Great Britain had supported Greece during the Civil War, but this support had diminished for a number of reasons. And a number of these reasons generally related to the struggles that Great Britain was dealing with at the time. So Great Britain was struggling to try and maintain the size of their empire. The empire was quite huge, and um, we start to see at the end of the Second World War the uh, the 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 contraction of the empire that would eventually lead out to the Suez Crisis in the 1950s, and then the formal end of the uh, of the uh, uh, British Empire in the 1990s with the handing back of Hong Kong. So Britain was struggling to maintain the size of the vast empire that it had uh, that it had inherited from two world wars, essentially, with military forces being stationed in a number of regions around the world. Britain was also three billion in debt as the result of economic problems at home as well as the Second World War itself. So Britain was dealing with a number of economic uh, problems and military infrastructure problems as well. And there was also the growth of political unrest in colonial regions such as India, Palestine and Egypt. Again, because of this sort of decolonial um, series of, of policies that begin to spread across the world at the end of the Second World War, with more and more um, colonies um, being granted independence until eventually the collapse of the British Empire entirely. Because of this, there was this uh, maintenance that had to be done across the British Empire, whereby Britain was trying to hold on as much as possible to as many of these regions as possible. India would eventually become independent. Egypt would eventually become independent and, and begin to um, take over the take back the Suez Canal. Uh, and then we also have the problems between um, Israel and Palestine continuing to take place as well. So all of these things are very problematic for Great Britain. And you can understand why, because of all these reasons, that support for Greece during the Civil War would become more and more diminished. The US, as a result of this diminished uh, support, became more and more concerned that there would be a collapse of both Greece and Turkey to communism if British support for those particular states were removed. And so the result of this was the introduction of the Truman Doctrine, which was introduced on the 12th of March of 1947. And the 12th of March 1947 Truman Doctrine would uh, lend itself to Congress granting a $400 million um, package of aid to Greece and Turkey. So we see here uh, uh, the first of the real introductions to the policy of containment, trying to prop up and uphold as many of these free capitalist states as humanly possible so that they would not fall to communism. As I've mentioned, we are going to go over each of the individual policies like the um, like the creation of NATO, like the, the, the Marshall Plan, the establishment of West Germany and reconstruction of Japan in their own ser se separate series of lessons. So the containment policy is something that we're going to talk about over the next few lessons uh, in way more detail.